Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Cody Miller. I'm one of the uh, ag agents in the Phillips Rooks Extension District. And I want to welcome everyone to the virtual crop talk. Uh, we have a great program we feel lined up today. Uh, if you're a repeat, I uh, want to thank you for joining in again. And uh, we'll, we'll slide, roll on to our next slide here. Uh, we've had uh, a group of agents, uh, specialists across the north central, northwest Kansas that have uh, came together and, and put these together. Uh, there's pictures as well as the names of the agents that have been involved uh, in getting this, uh, uh, these great crop talks uh, uh, made possible here. So throughout here, a couple of housekeeping uh, items that we have today. Throughout this session, if you have any uh, questions or any of this, uh, if you're using Zoom, use the question and answer box. If you're watching on YouTube live, uh, you can type the question into the comment box uh, once an account is created. Uh, if you have any technical difficulties, you can put that in the chat box and hopefully somebody can help uh, resolve that for you as well. If you are uh, needing CCA credits, we are offering those. There's two ways to get those credits. First of all, you can email Jeannie at jfalkjones at ksu.edu. You can do that here at the beginning as well as the end of the webinar. And if you include in your email your name as well as your CCA number. And the second option, you can scan the QR code with your Certified Crop Advisor app at the end of the webinar. So we have two speakers that uh, will be uh, presenting here today. Uh, Dr. Romulo Lalato, as well as Anthony Zukoff. Uh, Romulo will uh, uh, be joining us here on our second uh, part of this. Uh, he is our wheat and forage specialist. Romulo is stationed uh, on our Manhattan campus there, uh, K-State. Um, many of you may have been in contact with Romulo last year. As you know, we had uh, uh, some interesting times of alfalfa production uh, last year, and hopefully this year is not the same, but uh, also, our, our other presenter this morning is going to be Anthony uh, Zukoff. Anthony stationed at the KSU Garden City uh, Extension Research Center, um, and uh, he has a great presentation, uh, mainly focusing on the, the alfalfa weevils uh, that he'll be presenting here. So with that, I'll uh, stop sharing mine. And Anthony, if you'd like to load yours. And as he's doing that, uh, I may mention that uh, uh, we do not have the handouts posted at this time, uh, but we will uh, have those handouts available. They will either be on the Northwest uh, area site where you registered for this, or they'll be on our county and district sites uh, that the agents are involved here. So with that, Anthony, we'll turn the reins over to you and, and let you take it away. And Anthony, you're muted as well there. Okay, can we hear me now? Yes, you're good to go. Okay, well, thanks for having me this morning. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna talk about alfalfa weevil and pyrethroid resistance, particularly resistance to uh, Lambda cyhalothrin. And then I'm gonna just tell you a little about uh, the status of this resistance in the Western part of the United States in general. And then we'll wrap up with some uh, suggestions and reminders for the 2021 growing season. So we'll introduce our culprit first. Uh, the alfalfa weevil is not a native pest to North America. It was actually introduced several different times to the United States um, in the first half of the 1900s. And it's actually considered a complex of three different strains. So we've got a Western and Eastern and an Egyptian strain alfalfa weevil. And while these are all considered to be the same species, um, the strains all have different, they have a little bit of a different bio biology and even behavioral qualities that make them unique. So if we're looking at Western Kansas, you see that it's possible to, to see, uh, have the Western and Eastern strains coexisting, 
And one interesting difference between those two strains is the peak population timing. So if you look at this, the Western strain tends to peak a little bit later in the season than the Eastern strain. Um, and in some regions of the United States, some of these difference actually can impact management decisions. So as we know, uh, alfalfa weevil is a major foliar pest of alfalfa. Um, the, the most important life stage in regards to damage for this pest is gonna be the larva. So you see there's small green uh, grub-like larva with a white stripe and a black head capsule. And the larva have a tendency to hide and shelter in the leaf terminals while they feed. So if you're not looking for this, this pest, um, it's easy to miss them until you see the extensive damage that they could cause. And the adults can be an issue as well, uh, especially after the alfalfa is cut. Adult weevils will actually feed on the stems and debark the stems, and this will stress out the plants. It'll hinder regrowth and even create stunted regrowth. So in regards to the resistance issues, uh, resistance issues in alfalfa weevil aren't really new. There are, there are in instances of problems back in the 60s with other classes of chemicals, but the issue with uh, pyrethroid resistance is relatively new. It was first reported out of Canada around two, 2015, uh, and in 2016, California began to have issues with it and became pretty widespread. And as you can see on this map, as of uh, 2019, all the states in red had reported some form of resistance problems going on. And in a couple slides, I'll summarize that for you. But before we get to that, I wanted to just talk about a couple states closer to home first, just to give you some information. So in Colorado, uh, resistance was first detected in 2017 to Lambda uh, Cyhalthrin. Uh, in 2016, at three different locations where they're trialing uh, different products, three different modes of action, they were performing as expected. Alfalfa weevil was under control and things looked fine. But in 2017, at these same locations, there was a failure of all three modes of action at two of the three sites. Um, and I don't have any direct experience with those trials or the data set, but I was told that at the time, they weren't using uh, crop oil concentrate with the endoxicarb, the steward. So they just wanted to point that out and make, make sure it was a known. But there were issues with the control in 2017. And then in 2019, Colorado lab verified uh, resistance to lambda cyhalothrin at seven out of nine sites on the front range. So verified resistance in Colorado. And then our neighbors to the south in Oklahoma, uh, I understand resistance was suspected in 2019 and even a couple seasons leading up to 2019. And last year they were able to verify with some uh, vial bioassays that there is resistance to lambda cyhalothrin in Oklahoma. Uh, they examined populations from five different sites across the state and their average control was 18%. And so to summarize that, uh, the report in 2019 from those states out west, um, so I just mentioned Oklahoma's got verified resistance, but lambda cyhalothrin resistance uh, is verified in Colorado, California, Montana, New Mexico, and Utah. And in addition to that, Washington and Wyoming are having issues with cobalt. So cobalt's got the chlorpyrifos plus the lambda cyhalothrin, and Washington has uh, verified resistance to that, and it is suspected in Wyoming. So where does that leave Kansas? This is some data that was collected last, last May. Um, we got some vials from Colorado collaborators, and these vials were pre-dosed with the lambda cyhalothrin. <clears throat> and so we, uh, second and third wild instar weevil larvae were collected in, in the western part of the state, uh, in, in the southwest, and then the location in the northwest. And the, the larvae were put in some of these vials, as you see in the photo, and they're exposed to the chemical for 48 hours, and then we uh, examined mortality. And in southwest Kansas and Finney County, uh, there's 23% mortality. And then in the northwest location, there's only 25% mortality. So this verifies that there is, in fact, lambda cyhalothrin resistance present in the western part of Kansas. Um, now, is that the case for all the counties? We don't know, um, but it's some, something to keep in mind is what they're seeing in states out west. While you know resistance might be widespread across a state, uh, it can be highly localized as well. So out in California, where they have resistance verified, 
in the north, in the south, there's spots in between that do not have any issues. So what kind of drives that? Um, well, one, spraying habits and patterns are definitely highly localized in the landscape. So not everybody's gonna be spraying the same thing or the same frequency on their property. And then additionally, adult weevils do not really tend to uh, disperse very long distance. So you'll get resistant populations that really kind of stay pretty localized. So that's possible here as well. But the important thing here is just letting you know that, you know, there is verified resistance out here. And so what, what is it that actually will be driving the formation of res resistance? Well, first and foremost, obviously, it's going to be the repeated use of the same insecticide every season, multiple times a season, or really the same mode of action. So those will all drive resistance. Um, additionally, poor coverage can be an issue. So if a product isn't getting put on properly, not enough carrier, uh, larva can simply escape control by not you know, encountering the chemical, or they could maybe get a uh, partial exposure and survive. And then that there will, will drive the creation of resistance in a population. And I wanted to take a minute just to focus on the tool set we have for alfalfa weevil management. And so this is a list from the K-State uh, alfalfa weevil management guide. And when you look at it, it looks like you have quite a bit to choose from, and I guess you do. But if you start looking at it from a mode of action standpoint, we only have four modes of action. So we have some organophosphates, and the list is really dominated by a lot of pyrethroids like lambda cyhalothrin. And we have some combinations of organophosphates and pyrethroids, some pyrethroids and diamides. And then finally, we have an example from the group 22 uh, set of chemicals, and that's indoxicarb or steward. So, you know, a pretty long list, but only four modes of action. So you can see that if you get one or two modes of action compromised, your uh, options for control plummet really quickly. So we need to keep this in mind. So, and there's some things that are just kind of contributing to just overall control difficulties with the alfalfa weevil lately. And one of those is an increase in mild winters or lack of extreme cold. Um, and we might not have that issue this year, but uh, it, it has been shown that winters can uh, knock back uh, some part of the populations of overwintering we adult weevils and kill them. Um, but with these mild winters, you're going to end up with greater adult survivor survival. Uh, you know, that's going to lead to more eggs being in the field, and you're going to start off spring with just a larger population of larvae to deal with. And remember, adult weevil females can lay up to 1,000 eggs, and even some references from overseas up to 1,500 eggs per female. And this is kind of an interesting thing people don't tend to think about, but how long do these adult weevils actually live? And it turns out adult weevils can live for two years, even a little bit more. So you'll have uh, adult weevils in, in a field for several seasons. So if you start getting resistant individuals, they're around for several seasons to pass on those genetics. And finally, and this is something that kind of needs more research in this region, but I, I mentioned the differences between strains earlier. Um, and that, that can drive some issues in some areas. For, exa for example, I mentioned the uh, peak population timing where the uh, Western weevil could peak a little bit later in the season than the Eastern strain. So if you have a mixed population in some area, you might start seeing uh, an extended activity um, through the season for you know, uh, larval action it might go longer than you expected. So that's something to think about as well. So moving forward, what, what now? Um, definitely we need to keep in mind uh, rotating our products that we're using. So if you're rotating to a new chemical, make sure you're rotating to a new mode of action as well. That's really important. Um, and as of that 2019 uh, multi-state report, at the time, indoxicarb steward was considered just fine for controlling alfalfa weevil. It was uh, recommended. And as far as I know, it, it should still be but be aware that it is being looked at in Kansas and Oklahoma to confirm it's still maintaining its effectiveness, you know, because as we lose some modes of action, we start putting pressure on different modes of action that can lead to issues too. So just keep that in mind. Um, and no matter what you're using, be sure to get out there and monitor your results. Um, and if you start to see problems or you think you have control issues, it's really important to reach out to the extension professionals and let us know so we can, um, you know, get on top of a problem before it gets too out of control, let the right people know and uh, et cetera. So, um, and I understand regional resistance monitoring will be ongoing, especially in regards to looking at different modes of action like the uh, steward. 
And as we're getting into the season, don't forget about some of the non-chemical controls that have been used in the past. Remember, that's just another tool in your tool belt for dealing with pests. Uh, so, you know, like grazing, uh, flaming, um, crushing. This is an interesting photo. It just shows where some heavy equipment went through a field, uh, crushed some of the alfalfa and in turn crushed some larva. And, you know, these are spots that overall got a little less damage than uh, surrounding plants. So keep that in mind. And just some reminders, um, like I said, coverage is tremendously important. So when you're uh, uh, putting stuff on with ground equipment and your shorter alfalfa, you're looking at 10 to 12 gallons per acre minimum. When you get up into taller alfalfa, you're gonna want at least 20 gallons per acre being put on. Um, at hollow cone nozzles adjusted to overlap just above the canopy will help get that product into all the nooks and crannies, help it get into those terminals where those sneaky larvae are, are uh, eating lunch. Um, and when we get into aerial application, uh, less than two gallons of acre uh, of spray per acre results in unsatisfactory control a lot of the time. With aerial application, you want two gallons minimum and really uh, more the better. So that's, that's a really important point. So keep that in mind. Um, and as far as scouting and thresholds, timing is tremendously important. Uh, young stands of alfalfa can be defoliated in as little as three days if you have a, a significant larval population. Uh, so you need, you know, once a week might not be no, enough to get out there to scout. Uh, and I want to mention the degree day uh, model that's that's used, which is a great tool. Uh, it'll let you know what's kind of what to expect in a general region based on air temperatures for the season. But don't just rely on the degree de degree day modeling. Don't sit around and wait for a certain number and then go out to the field and check. Uh, just use it as a tool so you kind of know what to expect, but there, you know you can't replace actually getting out to the field and getting your eyes on a crop and uh, staying vigilant. Uh, so for early season management, you know, if you got one to two larvae per stem on a shorter alfalfa and you, you see some evident feeding damage to the top inch, you might need to, need to treat. Um, when you're getting in taller stuff, eight to 14 inches, and you get 30 to 50% of your terminals showing damage, and you you've four plus larvae per stem, you might want to treat. Um, and then stubble sprays might be necessary as well. So if you cut your alfalfa and you're finding active larva eight plus per square foot, if it's really droughty four plus, you might need to do a stubble spray. And if you're having late season issues, early cutting is an option. If you can get the hay out of the field quickly enough, um, expose those larva to the, the elements that might help knock them back. Um, if conditions aren't favorable to cutting immediately, uh, so if the weather uh, is, you know, favorable to larval survivorship and um, maybe weather will stress the plant so you won't have really quick regrowth, you might want to spray before cutting if you're having issues late season. So some reminders on that. Um, and I want to wrap up here just to put some things in your in your mind. So the alfalfa weevil we know is definitely an issue, it causes a lot of, a lot of damage, but alfalfa is a really interesting crop. It's a, the, the insect community is extremely diverse. And so you have a lot of diversity in pests as well. So another foliar pest is the clover leaf weevil. And it doesn't tend to get to population levels like alfalfa weevil, but just keep in mind, it is another pest out there that's contributing to the damage that's being done by the alfalfa weevil, kind of just adds up. And also there are actually root pests for alfalfa out there, the clover root circulio and the white fringed weevil. Their larvae aren't foliar pests, they're actually below the ground feeding on roots, and that's going to stress out the above ground growth. So with the clover root circulio, you can see it could be an issue potentially along the Kansas-Nebraska border uh, in eastern Kansas, but the grubs will be below ground feeding on the roots, stressing out the plants, and this is kind of a cryptic pest, so people will start seeing their plants stressing out, and they might mistake this for nutrient stress a lot of the times that happens. And the same goes for the white fringe beetle. Same thing, uh, people start seeing their uh, plants get stressed out. They think it's nutrient stress uh, and actually you have some action below ground uh, damaging root systems. And a final below ground pest, and this, as I understand it, is kind of new in the last 10 or so years. I saw a few seasons ago as an issue in some soybeans in Western Kansas, but it's a true bug that lives below the ground. It's a mealy bug. Same thing, root feeder stresses the above ground plants. And this is kind of interesting because ants move it around a lot. So this thing can spread pretty quickly throughout a field because of the ants. So if you have a field that's looking strange and you can't explain it, I recommend just getting out there and pulling up plants and checking out the roots. And you might find some of these additional pests out there. 
So I just wanted to leave you with that to keep in mind for this season. And that that's all I have for now. Thank you. Okay. All right, and at this time we'll have uh, Romulo uh, Lolato uh, roll into his presentation. Very well, Cody. Can you see the my slide set there? Yes, we can, Romulo. Okay, excellent. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, for putting this together, Cody, and 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 everybody else was involved in in putting this program together. Appreciate the invitation. Uh, also, thanks, Anthony, for a uh, great setting up the the, the stage there. Um, so I'm just going to follow up on, on, on Anthony and very briefly, we're going to discuss so what happened last year, right? What happened in 2020 and why did we have so many problems, so many producers concerned with the status of the alfalfa crop and how it related as well to, to weevil, right? So very, very briefly, because Anthony already kind of covered this. So if we look at the cycle uh, of the alfalfa weevil, um, and we look on those temperatures, right? So the, that's the adult there. These are the, the, the eggs here, kind of yellow turn orange later on. But importantly that I want to focus here is that we have about 300 degrees Fahrenheit. So think of these as, as insects that are quite um, developed based on temperature here. And Anthony also mentioned the possibility for winter survival of, uh, of these, right? And so this 300 Fahrenheit here, many times if we just consider starting on January 1st, we on average there count of about 180 Fahrenheit, but this really de depends on when in the fall the, the eggs were laid and also how much temperature was accumulated in the fall. And then again, the larvae here, which is going to be uh, our most important uh, economical damage uh, to the crop. And this larva is going to feed for about, again, roughly here, uh, 750 degrees Fahrenheit. All of these using as a base temperature, 48 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're only counting days that average more than 48 degrees Fahrenheit. And these translate roughly four to five weeks, perhaps on a cool year, up to five weeks uh, here, right? So this, uh, this is the cycle here. If we look at these within Kansas, uh, when do these phases happen? Right, so uh, the uh, eggs are going to be laid either in the fall and, and spring, but the larvae here, which is the blue one, is going to happen again between April and June, mostly uh, hurting that first yield, sometimes the second yield as well. So let's look at uh, an example here for Kansas, and if we look at Osborne there in north central Kansas, how do this temperature accumulation looks like? So again, we're using a base temperature of 48 degrees. Uh, we have the day of the year here, right? Day 40 being February 10th. Um, and two different years, 2020, which is the last year that we we're interested in, and then 2016, which had a warmer winter, right? And here's the cumul cumulative uh, growing degree days. So if we count of about 180 for those eggs to start hatching, 180 degrees there, these would translate April 21st in 2020, as compared to as early as about April 5th in a warmer year, um, like 2016 there. And then the, the, the larvae goes through those uh, stages of developing, right? We need to begin scouting there. Um, we had the first inter, inster when I had the leaf pin holding, uh, second and third insters wh where we have more defoliation and the third and fourth in insters, more defoliation as well. And then typically the 750 degrees there, um, we end the cycle uh, in these two years, they ended about May 29th to June 30th, uh, third, right? So that's more or less the, the cycle and the bulk of the economic damage will happen here on third and fourth instars, second instars perhaps as well. Um, so just for us to, to have a visual here on the leaf and holding, this is what we, we, we mean with that type of damage. Right, just these very small holes in the leaves here, typically on the upper leaves. And then as the larvae progresses into the, those third and fourth insters, we see more economic damage, uh, giving this uh, ragged grayish white appearance to, to the alfalfa field. So this photo here really shows uh, insecticide treatments, right? So whenever there was no spray of insecticide, we can really see this grayish appearance due to uh, the feeding of the larvae areas where insecticides were applied, it's nice and green. Okay, so what happened in 2020, right? Let's go a little bit more in detail here. So 
if in Osborne, again, we look at the minimum temperatures, right? So this is, uh, again, the day of the year, going from February, uh, um, starting February 10th there. We see, of course, that the minimum temperatures are increasing as we reach spring and close to summer. But what I want to call attention here is these uh, four dips that we had in temperatures. The first one on March 20th here, right? The very cold temperatures, about uh, mid-teens there. And then we had uh, a few more consecutive days here where the minimum temperatures were very low and reaching those uh, 15 degrees or so. So uh, it was not uncommon for us to travel around that north central part of the state and, and most of the state actually. Uh, and if we're traveling late April, that's kind of what we were seeing. So uh, this is an example there for Smith County uh, traveling around April 20th. So we can start seeing some of those leaf damages as well. Um, and if we're actually traveling later on, uh, sometime in early May, we have these, uh, we had these type of symptoms here, right? So these are some photos that Cody sent, uh, sent to me last year. We can really see how that cold damage really affected the, the, the leaf area and, and perhaps even some of the crowns of these stand here, right? So, uh, we were seeing a crop in this condition, and then we're thinking, well, it's already early May, early to mid May. Do we, do we really spray anything to control weevils here or not, right? Uh, we have another photo here again from, from Phillips uh, County uh, showing the, the extent of the damage there, the, 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 the cold damage that we had, right? So that was the question that we were facing, right? I mean, should we spray for weevil? Uh, it's already kind of early to mid-May, and this is the crop condition. So it's a very, very tough call because it's hard for us to really know the yield potential of that crop. But if we would look back and try to use that tool, the temperature tool, to help us at least take that, this decision, and I completely agree with, with Anthony here. It's not something that we need to base ourselves 100%. We need to go out and scout. But can, can it help us take that decision, right? So if we look again, uh, this last year on that graph of temperature accumulation that we were seeing before. Uh, this here is exactly when we had those cold spells. So we see that we are not accumulating any growing degree days there because we had those very low minimum temperatures and we're not just simply not accumulating temperatures, average temperatures in the day above 48 Fahrenheit. Now, if we overlay this graph, knowing that this is where we were at the end at that cold spell, with the cycle there of the alfalfa weevil, right? We see that we're just at that beginning, right? We're actually, although it's already uh, late April to early May, it had been such a cold winter that based on temperature alone, this tells us that, well, we're still just needing to start to scout, just begin scouting. So the, the, the weevil actually had the entire uh, uh, cycle, the, the larvae still had the entire cycle there to feed on that alfalfa stem. So it was a very tough decision because looking at that crop, you don't know the, the potential that it has, but at the same time, um, the, the, the alfalfa weevil still, the, the larvae still had the entire uh, larval cycle to, to go ahead and, and feed on that crop. So if we <clears throat> look back on some of our recommendations at that time, right, whenever uh, we have freeze damage alfalfa, some of the recommendations here, of course, would be there to check for some new growth, Right, if the new growth is coming from the tip of the stem, likely the growing point, point was not affected. Uh, if it's coming from the crown buds, uh, there might be very little regrowth coming from those damaged stems. Um, so, and there's other recommendations there, but one of them that I just want to really uh, call your attention there is just to watch carefully for alfalfa weevil, right? And treat immediately uh, if the, those thresholds uh, of economic damage are met. Um, so, these are some of the recommendations that we had back on that time. And looking at the damage that those alfalfa weevils could uh, have in the stand, there are, of course, either the direct losses or uh, losses that will last longer, right? So direct losses, uh, if we're having about 30 to 35 stamps per square foot stand, uh, each additional larvae that we're finding there can consume up to 170 pounds of hay during its life cycle. So it's quite a bit of a, a hay consumption for a single larvae there. So the direct losses in the first cutting can be north of a ton per acre. So uh, quite a bit, uh, very large losses in that first cutting. 
Um, and then, of course, you have other consequences like delay on the crop cycle because you have very heavy infestations and that, that freeze damage as well. Uh, and we can have a reduced stand life. Now, another important thing that we need to discuss is as well are carryover losses. So if we look back last year and we say, okay, we had, um, we had the, the freeze issue that might have reduced some of the stand. We also have uh, issues with uh, growers who did not who, who, who chose not to, to spray for the weevil. And so we also had those uh, losses that might have been north of a ton per, per acre there, depending on the weevil infestation. Uh, what are the potential for those carryover losses, right? And there's some, there's some previous research that show that uh, the losses to the next cut, so far the first cut, a ton or more per acre, and if that, the, those losses in the first cut are very severe, and by very severe, I mean uh, 1, 1. 1.5 tons per acre losses, then we can have losses in the second cut of close to a ton per acre as well, on the third cut, uh, six, uh, half a ton per acre, or, and then up to the fourth cut, a quarter ton per acre or so, or, or so. So really, we have these carryover losses depending on how intense the feeding was in the very first cut. So with that, very important, uh, what do we do, right? And so a uh, couple of things that we need to think, uh, of course, uh, Anthony already covered all of the management of the weevil itself. So I would just more focus on some of the other things, like uh, agronomic things that we can do to ensure that the stand has the best possibility to, uh, to make it through and to, to recover. Um, so one of them is cutting management. Right, so if we look at uh, cutting management, just make sure that we follow those best management practices, right? That we're always cutting about two inches above the soil surface, so we're not cutting the, the auxiliary buds. Um, avoid, avoid very short cutting intervals, right? Just avoid the, the going there every four weeks and, and having the, those cuts. Um, taking care as well with that winter dormancy, so make sure that the last cut prior to the dormancy. Uh, leaves at least uh, eight, uh, four to six weeks of growth there or eight to 12 uh, inches uh, stubble before the killing freeze. So there's an, enough time to, re to replenish those root reserves. And then fertility, right? I have here in this slide adequate potassium fertility, but really uh, alfalfa is a crop that removes quite a bit of nutrients from the soil. So making sure that we have those nutrients back in the profile, especially before we start with our next spring, uh, is actually uh, a good recommendation. So with these, we're reducing the stresses from cutting. We're also reducing the stress from fertility. So very briefly, uh, if we look at fertility there, right, uh, with three to five cuts per year, actually alfalfa is going to be a, a very high scavenger of nutrients. It's going to use quite a bit of nutrients in, in this graph here. Um, I'm actually showing the nutrient removed per ton of alfalfa. So you see there that uh, K2O, a ton of alfalfa is going to remove up to, to 60 pounds K2O per acre. Uh, the next nutrient is nitrogen, although alfalfa is going to be fixing its own nitrogen, so we don't need to worry with, with that. Uh, but then we have calcium, uh, phosphorus, sulfur, and, and other nutrients that are in a smaller quantity. Um, but again, making sure that pH will be number one, right, higher than 6.5. And then potassium number two, and that we have some good nutrients as well, just to make sure that we don't have other limiting factors to the alfalfa. And so uh, we're, th those, those are not limiting factors to regrowth and to recover of the crop. Um, so here is just a, a few tables here about the phosphorus management, uh, how much we actually need to be looking into uh, putting out there to the crop, uh, depending on the initial uh, soil phosphorus test. Same thing for potassium. This is all available at K-State uh, publication back from 1998. So depending on soil potassium levels, how much you need to be thinking about uh, replenishing there. And one nutrient that uh, less and less thought about that is uh, sulfur. And so here's just an example here of the alfalfa forage yield as affected by sulfur management in a sandier site where we don't have much sulfur to, to start with, right? So if you have zero uh, units of sulfur in the red line, really not much growth there. If we have 20 units of sulfur in the blue line, uh, again, if the sulfur is limiting in that soil, uh, then um, it's worth to go ahead and, and add sulfur. So um, with 
take homes, right? So it's from from uh, the 2020 freeze. Um, Okay, many growers end up not controlling the weevils, right? Because of either uh, unsure about the yield potential at the, after the freeze or the time, right? We're actually mid-May, early to mid-May, so it's close to termination, all that feed window, how much damage can the, 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 the larvae still do? Um, then it, it, of course, has potential for the direct effects of the losses to the crop, but can carry over losses as well, depending on how intense that feeding was. And then finally, as far as recommendation to reduce other, the recommendations are to reduce other potential stresses to the crop. In this case, we talked about proper cutting management, proper fertility as well. So just making sure that uh, we're reducing any other potential stresses to the crop, um, make sure that the crop has the best potential to recover. So that, uh, Cody, wraps up my, my portion here. Um, there's my contact information there in the screen uh, if growers want you to reach out. And uh, with that, I will um, I will stop sharing. All right, thank you, Romulo. I believe Cody is going to be getting our final slides up, but um, Craig has put it into the chat box here. Are there any questions that we have for either Anthony or Romulo so far? Craig, are you seeing any? Yeah, uh, I think this came from maybe YouTube or from Sandra, either way, but do you base your sulfur applications on on rates on the soil test? Yeah, that's a good question. So do we base our sulfur application based on rates, uh, based on the soil test? And the soil test for sulfur, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit iffy, right? I mean, we don't have as much confidence in the results coming from the soil test from for sulfur as we do for phosphorus or for uh, nitrogen or some other nutrients, right? So uh, I would probably base it on a few different things here. If you, if you are already in a high organic matter soil, let's say that you have two and a half, three percent organic matter type of soil, you're less likely to see sulfur deficiencies in those cases because the organic matter is going to release uh, quite a bit of sulfur. Uh, so it's pretty safe for you to just replenish what you're taking off, right? If, you, if we calculate there how much sulfur uh, a pound of alfalfa is taken up, right? It's usually, I mean, it's usually going to be anywhere from 10 to 12 units of sulfur total uh, per acre on an average yield for Kansas. You know, that should be more than enough. So it could be just based on, on replenishing that. Now, if you're in a lower organic matter site, you know, you want to be in, in probably in the safer side and, and, and have more than that amount that the crop is going to just be replenishing what it's taking up. So I think it will be safer to more go based on what the crop yield goal is and how much, um, how much you intend to, to harvest out of that crop, kind of adjusting based on organic matter for, for each soil, uh, then the soil test sulfur itself. All right, then uh, we'll go back to Anthony. Uh, Stacy Campbell had this one about using a roller or, uh, for to crush the alfalfa weevil eggs, uh, you know, for controlling them that way. And I'll add that to that. What if somebody would do that? And then plus, uh, like with this cold weather we had, would that uh, help with control? Yeah, I think it, it, it probably would. This cold weather, I, I, I was anticipating a question about that. And so I went online and tried to find some re research about uh, cold weather effects on eggs and all the different life stages. I could only find one study out of Iran. It was a semi-arid region, kind of similar to our, our area. But they uh, collected wild overwintering uh, alfalfa weevil and they subjected them to a bunch of temperature regimes in the lab and stuff. And they found that there's significant mortality once you start getting below 12 degrees Fahrenheit for more than 24 hours. So, I mean, it's possible that this severe cold snap we had might've knocked out some weevils, maybe more than normal, but it's hard to really predict that. But uh, it'll be interesting to see how the season starts up. And I did put a link in the uh, chat to uh, uh, the entomology uh, website. That there's a link to a document for non-chemical control methods that was put out in the late 80s. It details a lot of those methods pretty well. So take a look at that if you're interested. All right. 
Sandra, are you seeing anything over on the YouTube side? I'm not seeing anything more right now. Okay. Okay. I could add a little bit more if I got a second. Um, sure. In regards to you know chemicals, I was curious about what kind of modes of action were uh, at the disposal of folks in California, uh, just comparing it to what we have. And it's pretty much the same, but uh, in California, they also include um, uh, the, chemo the number five group of chemicals, and this is spinosad. And in Kansas, Entrust is spinosad and it's labeled for alfalfa weevil, uh, but it's more of like a suppression thing. So I'm not, I, no, that hasn't been looked at in Kansas for a method of control, but it's a different mode of action. If someone gets into a really big bind, I don't know how economically limiting it would be to use that here, but uh, in Maryland and in California, they would be getting maybe average 75 to 80% control of adult weevils. So just throw that out there. Like I said, it has been looked at in Kansas, but I came across in research I was doing. All right, thank you, Anthony. Any other questions for these folks? We've still got some time. Oh, there's one from Sandra there. Yeah, looks like she's asking, is alfalfa more prone to diseases because of the cold temperatures uh, from last April? Hi, Sandra. Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that it w where your thought is going there are maybe some root type of diseases if we had some, some damage to the crown. Um, if there was some damage to the crown, it might be. I don't think we will we, have any other issues with like a leaf diseases or anything along those lines. But uh, like crown, stem or, or root rot complex, you know, if, if we have a, an opening in the crown there coming from that cold temperature, you know, it might be more exposed to uh, to some of those uh, vascular type of diseases, fusarium uh, wilt or something along these lines. All right, any other questions while we still have these folks? We've still got plenty of time for questions, it looks like. If not, we can roll through a couple other things here, Cody. All right, up on the screen, you should see the QR code. If you are needing CCA credits, you can go ahead and scan that code now, or you can email Jeannie at jfalkjones at ksu.edu if you are needing those CCA credits. Um, I know there's a few folks that are on that will be needing those. So if you need those, just go ahead and follow those directions that are there on the slide now. And go ahead, Cody. And up in the chat box now, at least on the Zoom side of things, there is a Qualtrics links. Um, we do appreciate everybody coming on board and joining us here today. Um, we do ask if you can to please complete the evaluation uh, with that link that is there in the chat box to help us with future programming um, and give us an idea. Um, looks like the it is also the link is up and running on the YouTube side as well. I know we have a few folks that joined us over there. So please follow those links and help us out with the evaluation. It'll only take just a couple of minutes and that information does come back to us and helps us out with the future programming and uh, you know some reporting things. So we do ask that you complete that again. Only takes a couple of minutes and it's very valuable for us on our end. So next week, coming up, don't forget, you can be back here at the same time on Tuesday at 1030, Corn Dynamics. We're going to have Dr. Lucas Haig is our Northwest Area Agronomist, and will be with us and covering a lot of information on the corn side of things. And that's probably going to wrap up our session, um, uh, the crop talk session for this spring. Should be our last session next week. So um, again, want to thank everybody for joining us. Make sure to follow our Qualtrics link for uh, their survey. If you do have any other questions for Anthony or Romulo, feel free to touch base with your local extension office, whether that's a county or district office. Um, there are several of us that are still on here now, 
or, or anybody that's at your local office and pass along that information, we can get in touch with either Anthony or Romulo. So we appreciate their time and bringing us this information today. And thanks again for, for joining us. And that's going to do it. We'll see you next week with uh, when we cover Corn Dynamics. Thanks, guys.